Welcome to the Glitter Boom Girls podcast. My name is Robbie McPherson. I'm over on the East Coast. And I'm Amy Asberg on the West Coast. So we're getting right into it today because we have a very special episode of the Glitter Boom Girls podcast. We have a guest star. Like, <gasps> I know, I know. I can't believe it. You guys know him. Like, everyone knows him. He's totally mm-hmm. world famous now. Like, he was in the Daily Mail, for God's sake. Like, that's it. You have arrived. He was on, featured on Wendy Williams. She mentioned him. I mean, I can't even believe he's, Everywhere. he's like, on our show. So yeah. um, his podcast is Behind the Velvet Rope. And, yes, you guessed it. It's David Yontav. Yay! Welcome, Hello. David. Hello. Thank you for welcoming. What an introduction. <laughs> I need like a marching band. I need like dancing girls. Like we are so thrilled that you're here. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm having my coffee, waking <laughs> up and life is good, right? Yes. Amen. Amen to that. So um, I know I have a million questions that I want to ask you. Amy has a million questions that she wants. We just want to pick your brain on everything. Okay. You yes. can ask me anything. I really am an open book. I tell people that all the time. Okay. So For first real. question, where did you get that? unbelievably fabulous chunky sweater you are not even going to believe this the answer is i got it so i before the world closed down besides being a podcast host for reality tv and bravo and all of that which we can get into i really lived like i am not one of those people on my deathbed who is going to look back and be like here's my list of what i wish i did it's just i'm not i I mean i don't really believe in people like that anyway it's just if anyone's like that call me because I can snap you out of it but I lived and I've been to 55 countries and I've been to all seven continents and I used to have a life and I was in Morocco and one night I mean this is crazy like that you ask about the sweater because it actually has a story I we slept in the Sahara Desert as one of our nights in Morocco and, you know, it's like Morocco. It's like it was August, July. It's, it's warm, people. Guess what? Guess what? They tell you when you're already in Morocco, when you're about to do your overnight in the Sahara Desert, that it's freezing. And you're like, but it's July. They're like, it does not matter. It will be freezing tonight. So in preparation, I'm a street vendor, I bought this. And let me tell you, it was freezing in the Sahara <laughs> Desert all night. What? And this sweater is literally like the thickest sweater I've ever had in my life and it's and now it's freezing in New York and so that's why I have it on and it's freezing in my apartment I live in a nice building I'm high up it, it's just so cold here that the heat literally is at the point of not working basically so there you go I love that story I thought I was gonna give you some like oh I got it down the street at like Saks no I need to know if you have taken off that sweater and thrown it in the parking lot to fight with Jax like his <laughs> chunky sweater remember he removed it and oh. threw it the this chunky is a, sweater. This is a jack sweater. It is. Yeah, I love it. And and I was today years old when I learned that the Sahara Desert is cold at night in July. Oh like, my god. Who goodness. knew? Who knew? So, yeah. so cold. And like I yeah, I don't even know if cold is the right word. It doesn't <laughs> I don't understand it either. But it's an experience, right, that you can talk about. Yeah, yeah. So obviously there's a lot to unpack here. So let's start with your hugely successful, fantastic, fabulous podcast. So how did you go from Morocco and buying the sweater from a street vendor to now you're like talking to Vicky Gunvalson and all these big stars on a podcast? Well, okay, I have reinvented myself 800 times. <laughs> Um, remember, like you said, and I want to pick your brain in another lifetime because you mentioned you wrote a book. I've written a book too. Don't even ask where it is. It's both like... Getting a book published is a nightmare, but that's a whole nother story. But right, so we can talk. Um, I have had a million careers. I went to college. I then went to law school. I then practiced corporate tax law. Yeah, like you guys are making a face. I always say this, like I am a closet smart person. (laughs) I am smart and I have life skills and life success, but I really, really just want to talk about Vicky Gumbleson and Vanderpump Rules and reality TV. Right. I don't want to talk about 
anything having to do with the real world. I don't want to talk about anything smart, anything intelligent. Move along. I just don't want it's boring. To it's boring. It's boring. And there's enough of that. And I will leave it. You know what it is? I, how can I say this? You can't, I, listen, I applaud everyone that is out there on the soapbox making change. I just feel like some things are just bigger than each of us. And let's, you know, have your beliefs and everything. But I just don't want to talk about it 24 hours a day. I just want to talk about stupid crap. Yeah, well, I'm it's, tired. It's, also, it's also kind of sometimes you just can't do anything about it. And, and right. yeah, you know, bravo to the people who are out there, you know, fighting for causes and all that. And maybe we all have our own little causes that, you know, but for some of us, myself included, I'm a pretend smart person. So not a closet smart person, but I'm like a pretend smart person. But I, yeah, I'm the same way. Um, I can sit down and I can have a talk with you about all kinds of stuff. But like Amy and I decided on this podcast, we do not do any, uh, you know, current events. We don't do politics. We don't do any of that because this is an escape. This is where you go, right? And I totally. think your, your podcast is kind of like that, even though your conversations might get to something, right? But they do. So my podcast, right. So I mean, like, so I was a corporate lawyer and then it's a long story. I quit that and I fell into recruiting and HR and then I had like a staffing agency and then I sold that and then I went in house and I ran, so I ran like HR and recruiting departments at a lot of big companies, like most notably Martha Stewart. I worked for Martha Stewart. That's Oh, wow. Some consider that a claim to fame. I consider it just like, hey, I survived and here I go. <laughs> um, having said that, I have nothing. It's funny because I am in the media with all my interviews. I do. So one publication, we don't need to mention which one it is. They found out that I worked for Martha Stewart and they run my interviews all the time when all this drama comes out. And they were like, well, we want to talk to you about this experience of working at Martha Stewart. I was like, listen. We can talk, but it's like off the record, right? Yeah. We talked after like an hour, the next minute they called me and they're like, that was the most amazing thing in the world. We have to run that. And I'm like, listen, I'm an open book, but I'm like, I really, I'm like, first of all, you're not running that. And it, it's until you really wrong me, I don't really need to speak out against you. I don't really, that's not my personality. And really Martha, look, she's, you don't get to the top of any field without being really good at what you do. And when you're good, you just don't have tolerance for nonsense. So no, working for Martha Stewart wasn't easy, but like I only come after you and speak out if you've really wronged me. And like, she didn't really wrong me. So it wasn't a pleasant, pleasant experience, but she's really good at what she does. But I did work for Martha Stewart. And then I worked at all these companies, they kept merging. And then like when my last company merged, I was like, I need a break. And I was always into reality TV, always, right from the beginning. The Simple Life, The Hills, Laguna Beach, all like old classics. So I just, and this is what my book is about. I was like, I, okay, it helps that I live in New York City. I'm like, I'm just going to become friends with these people we see on TV. I mean, they're not Beyonce. This isn't like, you know, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. These are real people. And we're in a certain age of social media that if you really want to, you put yourself in harm's way and in, in, in pleasantries <laughs> way. you can put yourself in the way of these people. So that's what I started to do. And I started to become friends with all these people. And then I realized when I was hanging out with some of these reality stars, no one's looking, there's no filming. And let me tell you, everything I see is just as interesting as what is on the damn TV. So I'm like, I'm going to start ah. a podcast. Yeah. So I, I, the more I was in this like inner circle, so to speak, I was like, what the hell am I going to do with this? Like, how is this a business? Because I ain't doing nothing with my life except drinking martinis and, you know, passing out drunk every night. So <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. There is <laughs> so nothing wrong with that. So then I just was like, well, you know, I'll start a podcast and maybe people are interested in these stories. And my pilot episode premiere was about me in Florida. And I was at this dinner with like Dolores Catania from New Jersey, Kelly Dodd from the OC and Ramona Singer from New York. And yes, oh Rick my Levin God, right. that is so, a trifecta right there. Right. So 
it literally was like, now listen, if there's anything really confidential, no, I'm not going to repeat it, but there was enough fodder. This dinner was just what you think it is. Ramona is sitting down. She has her f- t- 10 courses in front of her before anyone else even opened the menu. Of course, I basically pretended like Dolores wasn't even there. I had to sit next to Ramona just because I'm a glutton for a pilot. Had to. Right. So it's like, I was like, maybe someone's interested in this story. Release the pilot episode. People were like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, this is for real. I'm like, this is a real story. So my podcast, it really started as like a two day a week. I'm going to tell you my stories, but it quickly morphed into three, four. Now we are five days a week. There are no stories. Stories are now on Patreon. And now it is literally just a five day a week interview show with like Vicky Gumbelson, Lala, whoever you can think of from reality TV and pop culture. It's not just reality TV. It's like we had Perez Hilton on, Melissa Rivers. So it's really just five days a week of me interviewing and I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. You know, like people who describe my interview style, which I think is pretty accurate. Like I will, here's how I describe it. I will ask you out on the date. I will pick you up. I will hold the door for you. I will take you out to a nice restaurant. You can have drinks, appetizers, dinner, dessert. I will pay for everything. I will hold the door as I drive you home and I will treat you like a perfect gentleman. But at the end of the night, daddy wants them. And daddy's (laughs) And so I think that's my interview style. We, 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 we start slow and we're talking and just, you know, and if there's things to ask, I will ask, but you know, it takes like, we, we, we lead up to that. We start with the easy ones Mm -hmm. and then I'm just like, okay, here are 13 things that we need to address right now before you go anywhere. And then it's like rapid fire. And then that when, but you know, listen, I mean, people don't have to answer something if they don't want to. And I don't know. There's, it's always, it's such a strange, then like I, like you said, I am on Wendy Williams and in all the press and then, you know, people have different reactions. These famous celebrities when they're all over the press, which I, I will stand behind every time. Like, you know how this works. Like, don't say something. I mean, I don't know. It's almost insulting when they're like, why is this over 17,000 magazines in 17,000 countries? It's like, did you think just because I'm like relaxing you that you were on like some podcast nobody was listening to. Like, I don't know. Like I I will always stand behind, like you said this, not me. So you need to go to therapy and deal with your own issues. This has nothing to do with me. Right. You know, that's something I notice about your interview style too, is uh, like you said, you just come right out. Okay. These are 13 things that we need to talk, you know, because I think a lot of celebrities and, even reality stars who are used to putting their lives out there, they're still used to being interviewed um, in a controlled environment, right? Where it's like, okay, I'm not co- talking about this. You can't ask about that. And there's publicists all in the way and everything. But yours are, all of your podcasts are, um, they're raw. That's how I would describe it. It's just this raw conversation. And, you know, if someone said, well, should I, like, like, let's pretend that I knew Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. <laughs> um, and they were like, should we go on his podcast? You know, my advice to any celebrity would be, well, yeah, just be authentic and know that whatever you really are is going to come across. Because that's, that's kind of, to me, that's the mark of a really good interviewer. You really bring it out of these people. Thank you. You know, and like, look, some people are more media trained than others. It's, you know, so I'm never let down, you know, certain people, it's kind of like your name alone gets you in the door. And I don't, you know, I don't tell them this, but if they, if it's look at, we have happy interviews where there's no headlines and no draw. It's like, it's such a good mix. And I think being five days a week, we can do that. You yeah. know, that's a lot so, of work. I mean, we know how much work lot. our little podcast is and we do it once a week. So do you do all your own editing and your own posting and everything? Or do you have help? I have help. I would say I do almost everything myself except editing. And I don't really edit. I edit a lot because anytime you chat with me for an hour and a half or over, it's a two-part episode. I have a lot of two-part episodes. People are always like, oh, two parts. It's like, (laughs) well, bitch, you listen to both of them. So, I mean, nobody wants to listen to an hour and a half. So it's like anytime it's an hour and a half or more, I break it into two episodes And it's just like reading the room. It's Mm -hmm. like, I can read the room of when, like, I would like you for seven hours, 
but I'm getting a good sense of like this hour that we booked is truly an hour. And that's okay. We can keep it an hour. And then other people get on. And after like 40 minutes, you just like breathe a sigh of relief of like, okay, this is going to be a two parter. It just is what it is. So it's like, I kind of make the decision on the spot. Mm -hmm. And then other people, I just realize like, oh shit, we're 35 minutes into this. I got to cut, you know, 30 things and just get to the meat because like this person really wants to go. So it's kind of like a, but other than that, I mean, I do, you know, that old saying, I mean, this, and I'm not meaning to sound like an ego, whatever, you know, if you want something done, just do it yourself. (laughs) I would love to find an amazing team. I have people that are involved, but uh, it's so hard to find. I mean, this is going to sound obnoxious, but it's so hard to find good help. (laughs) That's not meant to sound obnoxious. I work like a dog. It's just each thing that I have someone helping me with, I'm just like, uh, you can do this a little so, better. But, can't so you? are you, how much of that though? Like but I, I don't edit myself. No, that I just can't do it. Um, it's well, yeah, it's time consuming, but I want to know how much of the not being able to find good help is you, you know, just like not being satisfied and you it's being David's a, high standards. Well, is what it, yeah, is. it could be a little bit of a control thing, you know, I, that, Ooh. A little bit, but like, for instance, I'll give you an example. Cause I mean, no one's, the people involved are not going to listen to this. I'm not that it's just, it's 80s. Ah, wait a minute. Well, <laughs> you know, know? <laughs> like they're young and like, they don't even know what the eighties is, but <laughs> you know, like, so I'm my own Instagram and I'm very aggressive on Instagram, like just, you know, in terms of like promotion and answering people. So if I hand over, say other aspects of social media to you, it's like, you've got to be aggressive. Like you should be tweeting like everything. Like, so then that type of thing gets me mad. Like, wait, 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 we were just mentioned on Wendy Williams. So why wasn't Wendy tweeted the 75 comments? Like uh, it's, it's not control at all. It's the opposite. Mm-hmm. It's that I don't want anything to do with Twitter. I don't really understand Twitter nor enjoy it. So it's like, I'm handing you this, this is part of your job. Just be aggressive. And you're like, well, we were just mentioned on Wendy Williams. Now that's a big deal in the scheme of like all the things we have going on. Oh, yeah. So why haven't we retweeted that, tweeted at Wendy, tweeted at, you know, Vicky, cause it was her story, tweeted at Lisa Rinna cause she was involved. Tweet Like we should have sent 800 tweets. Like that's just my style mm-hmm. of social media. Now, so are I don't these, but I have to ask, are these like like Sonia interns or, you know, are they like, these are paid as and everyone is paid. Everyone is paid. And yeah. you know, no excuse then. No, yeah, no, no excuse. Yeah. So like I do most everything myself and even the light editing, like if there's no editing it, like I intro outro, I can do that myself, but it's when like breaking it in half, I just, I'm like, I don't even have time. Yeah. And editing's hard and um, it's hard to get it right. I, I, I will say like in our shows, we don't edit out like content, like we don't change the content, but you know how it is where, especially me, because of the way I talk, I have these pauses where I go, um, like, I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, and that goes on for like 20 seconds. And so I'll just go in and like remove some of those, but it's very, very tedious and very time consuming. Definitely. You are a better woman than me. Cause I don't, <laughs> I do not edit those out. And like certain people, say, and I get it. Like I'm self-aware. I say like all the time. So I get, you know, reviews. We were just talking about reviews that are like, um, the following 75 shows you said, <laughs> like, I'm like, okay, well, thank you for listening to 75 of my shows. You're obviously a fan, but you know, I can't stop saying like, it just is what it is. And so I could edit those things out, but I, don't have the energy, nor do I care. It just is what it is. And listen, I think people like that about my show. They love that. Like you said, like it's raw Mm -hmm. and it's like, people say it's like having a conversation with a friend. The only time I really edit something out is if there's a big gap in tech. So like, even if someone says like, wait a second, wait a second, can you hear me? I I won't even edit that out. Mm Mm-hmm. Once I'm editing the show, sure, then it's fair game. But like, I try not. So if someone said that, I wouldn't edit it out. But then I have people that are like, hello, hello. And then yes, I'm dead silent (laughs) for four minutes because you're, you're, you're somewhere. And then you come back and I'm like, well, welcome back. Your internet wasn't working. And then it's like, okay, once, once the show is going to edit and I'm paying someone, then I'm like, okay, then I'd like all the following things out. But I really just don't want to edit. I feel like 
that's the point of my show is just to have a natural conversation. So if your dog is barking and jumps up in your lap and you're like, I'm so sorry for my dog or my screaming kid, I'm like, bring it on. Right. I mean, it's, that's not ideal, but people tend to, I think, like those things. They see like these famous people like in a different setting. Yeah, it's, it's honest. It's authentic. Yeah, right, it's authentic. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, okay, I want to ask you one more question about your podcast and then uh yeah. and then and we can remind everybody uh, where they can hear it it's on apple right spotify um you can go with do you have a website um it is on apple spotify anywhere podcasts are found behind the velvet rope and the easiest place to find me is on instagram but it's behind velvet rope there's no the so behind velvet rope oh, okay. on instagram or so behind the YouTube. velvet rope yeah, and like we put clips on YouTube, but Instagram behind Velvet Rope, I mean, that's me. So if you reach out, I will. I mean, I tell people anyone who's interested in reality TV or pop culture, this is the podcast for them because A, nobody else is doing a five day a week reality TV pop culture show. And B, it truly is interviews every day. And it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a lot of Bravo and Housewives, but it's not all. Like we've done The Hills. The real world, um, Laguna Beach. We just had people from America's Next Top Model. I mean, we cover. We do The Bachelor. We have guests from every show. Eighties. We've had Taylor Dane on. <gasps> you know, so there you go. Yeah, like we've had, hot. right? Like we have. We had Melissa Rivers, which I mean, she's eighties, nineties, whatever. You know, we 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 branch out. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the more we go on, the more we're branching out. Yeah, and speak, we have a lot of girls from RuPaul's Drag Race. If that's watches where drag. I was going yeah. because Amy is a huge RuPaul's Drag Race fan. I mean, I am too, but Amy's like the nth degree. Serving you eleganza, honey. Yeah, yeah. Well, so eleganza. Tell us a little bit about uh, how how that came about because I have to say, people, if you guys have not listened to some of these interviews with these unbelievable. Uh, hilarious talented drag queens you gotta hear it so tell us about that david well you know so like when i started it really was the housewives and bravo and just again like having run businesses i sold my business there was some point in this thing look at i have a business mind it's just how i think i'm kind of like bethany frankel in that sense it's a business so at some point in this experience i said wait a second this 99.9% .9 Bravo, which has brought us an audience, is just not a good business model for so many reasons. So many reasons. You know, it's a small community. The network is involved sometimes. Like you mentioned publicists, and there is there is approval and people involved sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's just not. And, like, there's an infinite amount of people. So, you know, now that we have this core Bravo audience, A, I don't want all my eggs in one basket, and B, how are we going to grow? Like, right. we've we've grown immensely, but now if you're a Bravo person, 98% of you have heard about us, and that's when I was like, I got to branch out, and there's so much else I, I enjoy in life. So that's why, you know, RuPaul's Drag Race is just one of those shows. I'm like, okay, you know, we're not going to go and interview, you know, someone in a, any political party because that's or some sports figure but i'm like what's one step outside the box and that's when i'm like oh wait bachelor the hills mtv you know blah blah and rupaul's drag race was one of them so right so we've interviewed like and we have a bunch more coming up we've interviewed like bob the drag queen trinity the talk we have a second part with trinity the talk coming up this week we've had on ms cracker We've gone old school with Peaches Christ and Lady Bunny. We've I had, love those two. Those were great interviews. Those are right. Those are good. And so it's like, and we we have it's not out yet. We have Evie Oddly coming up, and we we were supposed to have people from this season of Drag Race, but it's now pushed off. You know, because of contracts and all that, of like mm -hmm. nobody can come on during the season. Like, fine. We were supposed to interview Elliot with two T's. We'll probably do that when the season's over. Yeah. So, you know what I have to say? Like, the drag queens as a whole, like, you would think, oh, we have Sugar Cane coming up. You would think, so anyone on RuPaul's Drag Race is now Fair Game, you would think that. They're the high maintenance ones. They're not. The drag, the the drag girls are nice. There's not a lot of slinging mud. It's just they're happy episodes. 
yeah. you know, they, they bring the drama and a lot of them are in drag, which I don't require. I mean, I always tell people don't get glammed up for me. I mean, I might have a chunky we sweater did. on, but well, that's very nice of you. <laughs> So like Ms. Cracker was like in full drag and I'm like, honey, it's like 1 p.m. on a Monday and she's just like, listen, it's it's I it helps me to dress and drag at home to feel and I'm like her personality. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah. more power to you. But we've had people where I'll say like the audio is going out, but I'm using clips of this on YouTube. And, you know, I mean, listen, sometimes people say no, but, you know, we've interviewed drag queens as not in drag and put out clips and they're fine with it. Sure, sure. So they're yeah. all, I mean, I think like which drag queen was my favorite if I had a pick, I would say probably just from an, you know, listen, you can't put, you know, just like that intangible. I think I loved Trinity and maybe Ms. Cracker second, just as far as, I mean, and that's another thing too. I don't get, I mean, you should see the comments I get when I interview all these people from Bravo and like people have really strong opinions because I know all these people in real life. I don't really get emotionally invested in the show. I love all the shows I watch, but I don't get like, I hate this part. So it's like, to me, it's like I can tell when we're having an emotional experience before, during and after. So I judge each person based on like what happened after and before the interview. Oh, like there's that's people that come on that I'm like, I love this person. You know, we had a great interview, but we also like kept in touch. You know, you just bond with certain people. Sure, sure. So I'm like, I understand that you hate this person on the TV and I am not taking that away from you. I just love this person as a human being and I don't really care what happens on the show because I know them. That's yeah. kind of how I judge everyone. Well, there is, uh, you know, people have to understand this by now, even though it's reality tv i mean not all of it is out there not all of it is real there's there's still a measure of control and a measure of editing and things that go on and and you know you hear enough of uh enough of stories like that where people know somebody in person and oh no no they're not like that at all you know so i think that's a that's something because audiences are more savvy so they really you know they know it's not all real um but i i i agree um, so I would love to move into, um, our neck of the woods now, because we have this person, you, who, um, is such an eighties, like lover and Amy, I- I'm a child of the seventies. So Amy's really like the eighties, you know, maven here, but, um, so what do you mean by a child of the seventies? Does that mean, cause I've always un- misunderstood this just in general. Do you mean you were born in the seventies or you were born in the sixties, grew up in the seventies? Um, uh, early seventies. That's so I grew up in the seventies. Yeah. Yeah. You and, grew up in the seventies. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, so I was like, a little Amy kid in the seventies. Born in this. Right. I was born in 73. So I right. feel Robbie, I feel like I'm both, but I mean, from six to 16, but the I thing was, is, like, you don't remember the 70s as well because you were young. So you were born in the 70s. You're a child correct. in the 80s. Yeah. That's, that's what Robbie says. I feel like I'm a little bit of a hybrid, but, you know. Well, and it's let also... me just say. Oh, go ahead. Well, no, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I've said this 8 million times. Now, I'm not going to clone myself. Maybe one day I'll start a podcast network and I'll have lots of people working underneath me. But if I could reinvent myself and I mean I am in this reality world and thrilled to be in it but if I could clone myself I would have the same podcast with 80s on the side I'm not going to do that because I'd be dead because there's no more time in the day when I'm doing five shows but I am as equally interested and know about the 80s and to be honest with you if as far as booking guests I would almost think, and this, I don't know for sure. I would think that booking some of the eighties guests, I don't know. It could be harder, but it could be easier. Yeah. It could be one or the other. Right. That's, right. So I would just have the same thing and I'd be booking like Joyce DeWitt on a Monday, Priscilla <gasps> Barnes on a Tuesday. Like this would be my life if I wasn't doing my reality podcast. Really? Like you said, you're a businessman. You are smart enough to divest. I mean, who knows? Who knows? You get, you know, you get all those, uh, workers and you know get a gaggle of sonia interns or whatever it takes and then you know put it together but you are welcome here yes to talk about it i'm gonna have to be back because i just i could talk about the 80s for i have a question for david yeah i need to know this this is how i i know someone seriously know someone young david is let's say seven year old eight year old david Mm -hmm. getting up on saturday morning 
what cartoons are you watching? What you are your what go-tos? Do well, you know what it is? This is where, so I, first of all, like, I'm one of those ladies who I, I lie about my age. Like, in, in the real world. I mean, you can go Google me. Okay. There's shit That's about fair. me on the internet. Night and day. <laughs> I, I am Googleable. But, right, no, no but I'm going to say, I, say young David. I lie about my age self with my age in the real life but then when i talk about music and tv that's when people are like wait i don't understand yeah. well, and i have so many guests that will say something to me like well you don't know what this is and i'm like oh sweetie like, i know so <laughs> the answer to your question is i didn't i wasn't a car i really hand to god wasn't a cartoon person but i can tell you like you know friday nights was like dukes of hazard then dallas oh, and falcon yes. crest and you know it was so I was there for like nighttime 80s TV. So which Duke was your Duke? Ooh, yeah, which Duke? Was it Bo or Luke? Probably Bo, but I'm not sure that would be the case now. Oh, interesting. Yeah, probably Bo. Okay. All right. And what what I have a story in real life about John <gasps> Schneider. Do I need to hear tell. it right now? Okay, it doesn't involve me. Let's let's not mention any names, but I have a okay. story except that, John Schneider. <laughs> right, except John Schneider, that John Schneider was at an event I was supposed to be at with some of my housewife friends. And, you know, they were all in the like, you know, hey, everybody buy a ticket, because these, you know, people are celebrities. And apparently, you know, I don't know the, like, this is, I'm getting these details. Like, they might be m mixed up a little bit. Like, John Schneider's wife, I guess, either stepped on one of the housewife's feet or was in her way. And there was, like, a, like, oh, hello, like, you're in my space. And John Schneider was like, don't you ever fucking speak to my wife like that again. Oh. And, yeah. So there was a, I there was love a that. scuffle. Between wow. John Schneider's wife and housewives. Yeah. No so kidding. They, yeah. Do you know, I I actually have uh, a John Schneider story, too. Um, oh, that was my cat, Alice. everybody. Oh. oh, wow. Oh, my Alice. God. You know what? Can, I, can we what? just, like, stop the presses for breaking news? The what? door on my porch just opened by itself. Well, that's Almost. scary. Right? Like, this is some... You in danger, some... <laughs> You in danger, girl. So, yeah. <laughs> so, here's my um, John Schneider story. So, he was a celebrity guest along with uh, Joyce DeWitt and Mindy Cohn at the World's Largest Disco. I don't know. Do you know about the World's Largest Disco, David? Well, perhaps... That's where this story comes from. Because oh, I wait, did he have side? Did he have wait, a cyber? Wait a minute. Okay, and, but, and I was supposed to be there, but I had to go to a Countess Luann cabaret. Oh, Ooh. you have to come next year. I will be there. We will have so much fun. You but, don't understand. I've I have friends that yeah. So I was supposed to go and hang out with John Schneider and Mindy Cohn and all this because I know the housewives. Well, that's I mean, right. now. Every, now everyone could Google and figure out which housewives it was and which all this, but whatever. Well, I, you know, what's weird though, is I was there and I never saw anything like that. And he was really, really nice, really chill. Um, I do know which housewives I, yeah. I saw them. Um, so I won't say, but, uh, but he, he was, he was just a really, really sweet guy. And the whole event is a fundraiser. So a, a, usually the celebrities that come are, you know, they're of a good mind and, um, you know, they just kind of understand it's all a big fundraiser, but oh my gosh, that is a crazy coincidence. I just feel like that I is... was supposed to be there. And yeah. so that's the thing. Like I, before COVID, I traveled the world really. Like I went to like celebrity conventions, you know, like if you could tell me like, you know, okay, like the cast of Three's Company, like you're going to get a picture with like Priscilla Barnes and Jenny Lee Harrison and Joyce DeWitt all in once in like Indiana. Like, you, you know, those celebrity conventions. Yeah. I went to them. Like I would have to go through my Instagram and pull up that. all the pictures because I went to so many, but I used to go and I used to be like, okay, so yeah, I got Three's Company. And, oh, wait a second. You're telling me like, you know, Cheryl, you know, Cheryl Ladd and Jock and Smith are going to be in, you know, Wisconsin. Well, I'm getting on. A, like, this was my life. I traveled oh, around for all of these 80s people. And and I OK, now you told me this uh, the other day, but you went to this South Fork thing for Dallas, <gasps> right? Because 
And and I, I have to hear about this. So while you're telling the it was story, amazing. I'm going to get up and I'm going to shut the door because it's 20 degrees out. Okay, so so you how did you end up at this thing? What is it? When was it? So I love Dallas. I feel it is one of the best shows that has ever existed in like the history of TV for so many reasons. It's like the storytelling was just so rich. Fist so rich. fights at the disco, ruined lives, audacity, power games, big hats, boardrooms, big hair, champagne, oil. They everything. don't make TV like that anymore. And like, so listen, a lot of my other favorite shows are more 90s. Like, I love Melrose Place, 90210. Yes. So, like, it gets, but Dallas, Dallas is one of my favorite shows of all time. And, like, first of all, what show now is coming on? Okay, Grey's Anatomy, SVU. We have some exceptions, but what show lasts for, like, you know, 78 18, right. through, like, yeah, right. 91. 90, yeah, 91. Yeah. So that's one thing. Just the storytelling was so rich. So I am a huge Dallas fan. So at that point, I had never met, you know, so my threshold for travel is like, have I met you 12 times or never at all? So it was after Larry Hagman passed away, unfortunately, but it was 2018, I think. Yeah, it was the 40th anniversary. And it was at South Fork. So right there, I'm like, okay. I mean, I wouldn't just go, but they're like special guests, Linda Gray, Charlene Tilton, Steve Canale, and Patrick Duffy. And, you know, <gasps> wow. it, it spells it out. Like day one, you're going to wait in line. You're going to get a group picture with them. Day two, bring whatever you want signs and you'll do one-on-one -on -one selfies. Wow. So I'm like, right then, I'm just like, and it's at South Fork. I never was at South Fork. So I'm like, this is like a no-brainer. Oh, I actually nice. had a friend who was like, oh my God, we're going to go. So we purchase our tickets and listen it was a shit show in the sense that there were a lot of people oh my god there were a lot of people like how, but, how many like a thousand well, or 500 or and they they kind of i think oversold it oh but if i had to take a guess i would say like yeah like a thousand maybe something like that <laughs> now so, um, and wait a minute is yeah. so south fork that's the what they use. That's the ranch they use for the exteriors of the the intro, right? So where, yeah, where and where cool. is that? It is in right outside Dallas. I forgot oh, okay. the town, but outside Dallas. Okay. So yeah, I went out with a friend. We stayed in a hotel, and this was like a three day event, a two day event. So I'm trying to think if it was two or three days. The first day, I think like they welcomed you, and then. Right away, you got, it was like an assembly line. You waited in line. And when I say waited, it was a long line. And it was literally like you got up to the front and you got a picture st in right in between Charlene and Linda and Steve and Patrick. So that alone, I mean, Worth Linda, it. Right. Linda Gray is one of the best, like, forever. Like, when I met her, I was like, you're like my favorite person ever. I mean, maybe she maybe isn't my favorite person ever, but she's up there. And, and she she's was like, so Sue gorgeous, Ellen. too, right? Sue Ellen, yeah. Sue Ellen. Like, to me, best character on Dallas. I mean, people could argue, but that's my favorite. And, yeah. She was so, complicated. Sue Ellen was complicated, uh, right? Linda Gray is just... Well, she was married to JR. She, she I mean, yeah, her, she had to deal her, with but that. her character... You know, Amy and I were talking about this in a... Uh, in in another uh, podcast episode about um, like eighties bitches, right? But like Sue Ellen, she she had this vulnerability, right? Like Linda Gray is such a great actress, and she, and to me, she brought this kind of vulnerability and steeliness. Like she she wasn't evil, but she could be evil, you know. But she and, did hook up with Jr.'s rival. Well, yeah, but look at all the that crap was, Jr. did to her, yeah, right? Just, it, it was, was all, you know, it's payback, it's payback, bitch. Yeah, but I, I just loved how she made the character. It, she wasn't all good or all bad, right? But that's the thing. You really felt for her, and just and what a character arc to go from. You know, like we, I did a zoom thing with her recently. It was one of those, like those celebrity conventions are now online. I have no interest in doing it online just because of what I do for a living. It's like, I don't need to <laughs> pay and get a picture or a screenshot with you online. But when it came to her, I paid for this. Cause it's like, you had like a one-on-one -on -one 
chat for like 15 minutes or something. And, you know, like she just said, like, look, like I went to them. I didn't want Swell to be a drunk anymore. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like I, I wish that there were more people at this thing before. Like, why didn't they invite like Audrey Landers? Why didn't they invite like Morgan Brittany? There's like a I lot of people her. that could have been there. But it was great. And then the next day you had like a barbecue at South Fork and you did one on ones like you you got something signed and you did one on one like pictures with that. Charlene Telton's like, why do I know you? Because I mean, I've met <laughs> so many times. It was just it was such a good show. Like, I, I love Dallas. And okay, it, I, I have Dallas questions for you. OK. And I didn't love dynasty knots landing or falcon crest as much not even close there was something about dallas was my show what can you can you identify was it just some unknown thing or was there a particular i think maybe just the timing like i started it at the right time you know what i mean like no i i, I can't really yeah i can't like by the time dynasty came around i was busy i never really was watching tv as much you know i think just like timing right. had something to do with it yeah, and, and Dallas was, so was kind of the good. first, it was the first sort of uh, family, you know, empire drama. Well, it was a male soap. It was the first nighttime soap that was kind of for men. And also, right, let's that's true. take a minute, like besides the Victoria Principle, like we had Barbara Eden on there. Mm -hmm. We had the national icon treasure that is Susan Lucci was on there. That was like her first nighttime, like I want to break out of Erica Kane and do something different with my life. And Tina Louise. Don't forget Tina Louise. Tina Louise and Christopher Atkins from oh, Lulu yeah. Members. Oh, Sue Ellen and he was, was like up. The, the camp counselor for Sue John Ellen Ross was or something. Up with him. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we had some really big people popping around. And Morgan Fairchild for one ep. Wasn't Morgan Fairchild Jenna Wade for like one episode? I think more than one episode. Oh, oh. And Priscilla Presley. Oh. oh, oh my gosh. Of course. I went to a Priscilla Presley book signing a few years ago in New Jersey. And I mean, I have to tell you like 90, it was a children's book, which I'm like, I don't, I don't have children. I don't really care. I'm going to buy this damn book. And like 99.9% .9 of the people were there dressed like Elvis. And when it was my turn, I was like, I'm sorry, sweetie. We need to talk about Jenna Wade. And she was <laughs> right. just, she was, I think, just so, she was like, you don't want to talk about Elvis. I'm like, you know, I don't know what to say about Elvis. That's, I have nothing to say. But we could talk about Jenna Wade all day, every day. And was she excited and relieved Thrilled. that someone was so not I, asking her about Elvis? I was just like, Dallas was like the best <laughs> thing. And, and mind you, Dallas 2.0 was brilliant. It was I, brilliant. Didn't, I never yes. saw it. I didn't get to that. Josh Henderson. Jesse Metcalf from Desperate Housewives. It was really good. It was really, and you know, it's a whole big thing where like the network heads at TNT came in and the ratings weren't great. Like they say that if the management didn't change, they would have got, because the way Dallas 2.0 ended was Christopher Ewing, Bobby and Pam's son died. And that was it. There's no like story after that. So it's just like, Linda Gray and they they all there was a whole online campaign of and Jordana Brewster was in it from the Fast and oh, the Furious. Right. So there was a whole online campaign of like just let them wrap it up. And you know, TN, you know, network heads, they're like, Yeah, we don't care. There's no there's no ratings here. But they the, the cast was really invested and they were like, We just want, you know, eight more episodes just to wrap this up. It was good. Was it as good as the original? No, but it was good. And Larry Hagman was in it at the beginning. I mean, mm -hmm. Jr. Oh, died. Right. Like Jr. died on in the story 2.0 because that's what happened in real life. That's it true. was, but they honored it. They did it so well. It was so good for the legacy of the show. It was a great show. It was not like the original, but for a reboot, people that it was great. Mm -hmm. And I like that the original was kind of a Romeo and Juliet. It started out like Bobby and, you know, the Ewings and the Barnes. Yeah. And it was also kind of a Cain and Abel uh, story, like J.R. and Bobby, the good and the bad. And I think that's kind of like how it started. And I love it was said, Linda Gray said a long time ago that she was trying to figure out the women, the, you know, rich Dallas women. And she went into this ladies room at some place in Dallas and she looked and watched this lady open up her little purse and she had in there a lipstick and a little Derringer, a little gun. And she was like, excuse me, is that a gun? And the, and the girl's like, yes, this is Texas. 
And she put on her lipstick. And Linda Gray was like, okay. She kind of figured it out right then and, and there. And Sue Ellen was born. <laughs> yeah. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's really neat. So uh, for the for the storylines, because Amy, you, you bring up a great point. To me, this is what I loved about the show. Um, even though I'm going to pretend like it all aired before I was born, but okay. I wasn't. So I would watch it on Friday nights, like you said, David, with my grandma. Because my parents, me too. Right, I watched they would, it with my grandma. Yeah, they would drop me off or whatever, and, I, and I'd Grandma be hanging Helen. out with her. And mm-hmm. um, and there and the layers of the story, it was like something for everybody. So you had the the power struggles with um with the brothers. Then you know you had Cliff Barnes, who was always like trying. You know he was like trying to trying to you know, and he could never quite get there, and so bitter and resentful. Then you had all the women. Um, and even though the women were the wives, like they were the wags, right? They mm-hmm. still um, they still gave so much uh, 3D stuff for these women to do. And I don't, I mean, I would assume maybe maybe you can tell us, David, if you've you know talked to these women about their parts. But I would assume for actresses, <clears throat> excuse me, who weren't like 20 anymore, these were juicy, juicy parts. Yeah, they were, and even parts like. Donna, like Donna and Ray, like Susan Howard, like even parts that didn't start juicy, like you were a B-list character, they developed over time, you know? Like Kristen, Kristen, for example, uh, Sue Ellen's younger <laughs> sister, and Mary look Crossy. what she went on to do. Kristen okay. was a good one. Right. So that's what I mean. Like they, they were good parts. The writing and the storytelling was so good. You know, and then you had like Lucy and Mitch, like they were the younger ones. So it's like they really had something for everyone, like you said, you know, like, OK, they made mistakes. They I mean, that's the other thing I think that was interesting. You know, now we have like housewives where people get fired and even real, real you know, real shows. But back then, a lot of shows didn't have these major cast changes, you know, like look at Dukes of Hazzard or anything else. Like right. Dallas was one of the first. I mean, Barbara Bel Geddes left and they recast her. Oh, so strange. <laughs> they recast her. It's so it's like they had, you know, Linda Gray left too and came back. You know, they, they, Patrick Ewing, uh, pa- 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 Patrick Duffy left. They killed. So it's like they had people leave and come back. And it's like that was unheard of at the time or recast. And then like the whole world gets in an uproar and then Barbara Balgetti's. I mean, people were leaving for money. Like people were having contract disputes and being like, I'm leaving. Or like Patrick Duffy was just like, I want to try something different. So, you know, that kept the show, I think, fresh. And that's now a trend, but that wasn't the trend back then. It was so ahead of its time in that Mm -hmm. sense. I mean, yeah, in 1986, suddenly you look up and there's Bobby in the shower. Right. Coming back from the dead. And and it was all a dream. The infamous dream. Wait a second. What's happening? So right. So and, and like, look, they kind of invented the cliffhanger. Yes. Oh, yeah. The way. season. You're right. That whole season ending thing where everyone, everyone was like, "What? I have to wait all summer before this is resolved." What? You're right. They did. Have you, David? Have you ever considered writing the definitive like oral history of Dallas or something like that? I have decided. I mean, I've thought of many things in my life. <laughs> It's just, <laughs> where would that time come from? Someone yeah. would have to, like, write it. They'd have to sit with me. Like, I mean, where is that time going to come from? But in theory, yeah, sure, that would be great. <laughs> okay, I need to know from both of Such you. Such a good show. Why did JR have that haircut of, of every boy in my second grade class? He had that little plastered bangs over his forehead. I need to know what that was about. And I need to know why Pam changed her hairstyle into these little poof bangs and this little short. I mean, she had that long, pretty hair. What, what was up with these Pam hairstyles, you two? Well, I would like to know. I mean, look, Victoria Principal, I mean, they say she really kept to herself. Like, oh, during... Oh, really? I mean, it, oh, during the takes, like, action, it really was. Patrick, Linda, and Larry were, like, three lifelong best friends. Really, that never stopped. And they just, you know, I don't think that none of them are going to speak bad about Victoria Principal, but she really just was always like she just never, yeah, you know, she always kept to herself. Were these were these Andy Gibb years? You know, Ooh. the some the, of them, some of them, yeah, yeah, because I mean, from from interviews that she's given, uh, you know, 
recently, many years after Andy passed away, um, you know, she talks about how challenging all that was with um, the problems that Andy was going through. That's that's kind of interesting. And then, of course, when they broke up, um, people just vilified her. And uh, and I did see one interview with her once where she she said uh, that it was either talk about Andy Gibbs problems with substance abuse and things like that or just let everybody think that she was like this you know man-eater heartbreaker whatever and uh, and she said she actually chose to just stay silent to um to not kind of sully up Andy's reputation and to make it easier for him which I always thought was really interesting I mean Amy that doesn't answer your question about the hair but <laughs> that doesn't I, I was, answer your question about the hair. No, I'm not sure. Hair I know. and makeup, hair and makeup. I just, I loved Morgan Brittany's big old poof, and then Audrey Lander. I just loved their, I loved their styling. Yeah, they, I love that. The hair did get bigger as the as the seasons went on. You know, the the what is it? The higher the hair, the closer to God in Texas, yeah. right? Um, but but I, you know, Victoria Principle, she doesn't do. I mean, I think she also doesn't need the money. She doesn't do like the celebrity conventions with them. But then again, if you look at it, Suzanne Summers isn't about to do that. Mm-hmm. And Jacqueline oh. Smith isn't about to do that. So I think that just has to do with money. Like Victoria Principal with her side businesses, I think is worth a good amount of money. Whereas yeah. the others, I think, you know, I don't think a, they're starving. She, she had skincare. Oh, yeah, skincare, some skincare or something, right? Yeah, Some kind of beauty. Yes, I think she wrote yeah. some books. Yeah, I think she's yeah. I mean, you know, what do I know? But I th- think like Victoria Principal is like the Suzanne Summers of the Dallas crew. Like she doesn't need the money. Interesting. She's she the in she's the oh. thigh master uh, or the th- <laughs> thigh mistress of. Dallas. And like I think also you know she never bonded with them, so it's not like you know like when you have something at South Fork and it's like Patrick Duffy and Linda, like they're all friends with Charlene. So it's like we're getting paid to go. Right. And with our friends. And yeah, you have to sit there and take pictures with like, you know, 1200 people, but you're getting a check. So why it's not? fun for them. Yeah. They yeah. get to see they had a different experience and she, she might think of kind of a bad time in her life. And who knows if that was. Well, that's know. true. Yeah. I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, maybe it's actually kind of painful for her to deal with that, but just like all of us in our lives, any, you know, like you described an awful, awful lot of different careers, David, and Amy and I, like we met waiting tables, you know, and each of us has had different jobs and you work with people who have all kinds of different personalities and it's exactly the same on a TV show set where not everybody gets along, not everybody likes everybody else and some people just like to say their lines and go back to the trailer, other people are like, hey, what's up, or, you know, so. Let's go out after, let's totally. Let's go the corner right. I mean, that's what it is. Like, you know, speaking to people five days a week on my show, that's like, I have a whole different relationship to like, quote unquote, celebrity and everything. Like it's, it's a job. So to me, yeah. Like, I just think when you're not realizing what it is, you just expect everyone to be, you know, friends. And even like when you hear about tension on set, you're like, well, yeah, it's a bunch of creative people who are into their characters who all, not even Dallas, just any show, who have an opinion on where their characters should go mm-hmm. and other people have an opinion on where their characters should go and it's just like, it's inevitable kind right. of thing. Um, so not we, for everyone, but you know what I mean. Um, we are uh, out of time um, on, on our show. Like, I can't believe it. Um, but I want to ask you and... and uh, I want to ask you, David, do you want to keep going for a little bit and do a second part? Do you have time? We can keep going, yeah. Okay, wonderful. We can do two parts. Wonderful. All right, so uh, I'm going to sign off of this episode, and then we'll just uh, we'll just pause and then start again. I am so excited I because it. I have so much more Yay. to talk to you about. Like yes. We have to cover Xanadu. We have to cover music. We love music. Okay, yes. so, um, so we're going to close out this show. I'm Robbie Ann McPherson, and... Uh, Go ahead, Aim. Talk about your book. I want you know what? Mention your I'm 80s Amy book. Asbury. I did write a book called Once Upon the 80s. If you want to remember every single little detail and every single little thing in your room and every commercial that came on, etc. Yeah. If you're feeling very manic and you want to read all about it, 
pick it up Barnes and Noble, Amazon, wherever books are sold. And thank you for listening. <laughs> and if anyone wants to listen to non eighties interviews with reality gurus and hey so at least check fun. out at least check out our Taylor Dane. I mean Ooh. was Taylor my favorite oh. guest ever? No. No. Oh, really? Taylor wasn't Tell it listen, to my heart. Ooh. She well, Taylor wasn't necessarily feeling me as much as Which others. Which is do. interesting in and of itself. I might have to listen for I am that shocked. Yeah. reason. I for yeah. one am shocked. I would have not called that. It's huh. weird. Like my Never know. Loyal listeners normally can tell and be like, well, is that person being rude to you? And I'm like, well, yeah, but most people can't. But check out, you know, Behind the Velvet Rope, anywhere podcasts are found. It is literally reality. If anyone listening to this watches reality TV, and it's not just Bravo, it's, but it's, it's a lot of outliers. Everything. It's, it's so everything. fun. And yeah. follow me on Instagram, Behind Velvet Rope. Yeah. And we have to, I, I mean, I 100% vouch for for even if even if you don't know anything about drag queens or you don't watch uh real housewives just the interviews themselves david is so great at getting people to just open up and say everything and they're really authentic yeah super truthful um i you know there were a couple that i listened to where i didn't even know who these people you know i'm old i I was like who is this but i i loved i got to know them and then i started googling and looking and you know that's a real talent you have david that's what I like, you know, and like, I'm not trying to change people's opinions. Sometimes people will listen and be like, I hated that person on the show. Now I see them as a human. I'm like, wow, that's a huge compliment. Not even what I'm trying to do. So right. if you, if it confirms that you still hate the person, great. Someone like you who could say you didn't know the person and you Google them and you're like, wow, what a talent. That's amazing too. So like, mm-hmm. I think there's something for everyone on the show. Yeah, I think that's well, definitely listen. true. And we're going to have links uh, on our uh, pages awesome. to our Glitter Bee Girls Twitter and uh, the Glitter Bee Girls on Instagram. So you can easily find David. But he's like world renowned now, you guys. So, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, You're anyway. too kind. <laughs> it's a privilege. It's the truth, man. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to close this out. And we are so thrilled we're going to have a part two. All right. So thanks for listening, you guys. See ya. Bye. Bye.